Good evening and welcome everyone to this uh, meeting of the Devon and Cornwall uh, Regional Group of the Institution of Structural Engineers. Uh, my name is Khuram Wadi. I'm acting chair of the uh, regional group uh, at the moment and it's my great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce tonight's talk and the speaker today we have is Peter Debney from Arup um, who will give a talk entitled the engineer and uh, of the future is a centaur. Uh, so just a little bit about Peter. Uh, Peter is pro product manager and application specialist at Oasis Software um, and uh, he was a, a Royal Academy uh, of Engineering visiting professor of structural engineering design and co computer simulation at the University of Bradford. Peter has worked in a, a wide range of engineering practices and industries, including uh, general building, uh, water, petrochemical and software. And he was elected to a uh, fellow of the ISTRUCT in 2019. Uh, Peter joined um, Arup in 2001 as a senior structural engineer and then transferred to the uh, Oasis group in 2005. He's now product manager for the structural software uh, um, suite, uh, an application specialist for the uh, mass motion uh, pedestrian simulator. Peter has published a book uh, called Computational Engineering uh, for the iStruct T and published several papers and journal articles uh, covering a wide range of engineering topics, including network theory, structural vibrations, uh, non-linear non analysis, optimization, and artificial intelligence. So how do we follow that? Okay, Peter, I think uh, we follow up with a, a, what look, I hope is going to be a very interesting talk. So uh, over to you. I hope so. Oh, thank, thank you, Karim. Oh, can I just oh. say um, before we start, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, everyone, if you haven't already um, muted your microphones, please do so. And also, we'll be taking questions at the end, but it would be nice if, if you will have any questions that you have want to put in the chat, I'll read them out at the end. At the end, if anybody wants to ask questions orally, uh, please use the raise hand facility uh, on uh, Zoom. Thank you, Peter. Um, that's all from me. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, so as Karim says, um, my my name is Peter Debney. Um, uh, yeah, and so tonight um, we're going to explore what is artificial artificial intelligence what it is not, how some of it works, um, and how we make might make use um, of some of it in engineering. Uh, so first of all, quick word from our sponsors. Um, so Oasis, um, Oasis, Oasis Software, we're um, totally owned by Arup, um, or also part of Arup Digital te te Technology, um, and formed way back in 1976 um, developing software for use within Arup but then also uh, for use um, externally um, as, as well and some of you may, may have used some of our software and um, we, we do structural geotechnical pedestrian simulation my particular interest is structural I'm a structural engineer um, but we have other things and also um, word from I struck T. So yes, um, uh, last year I published a book, Computational Engineering, um, which is the, the idea is it covers or tries to cover at least the range of computation um, methods and practices and so on that that that, that you might use as a structural engineer, um, ranging from the everyday um, right up to the um, the more some of the more advanced, but it, it's um the idea. The book is a broad book rather than particularly deep, like like you would do with a specialised um textbook. Um, so um, what is a a centaur? And um, what do I mean by centaur? Um, now the title of this play um this. This, this talk is on the paper as well. It was really inspired by Gary Kasparov, who you may know was the um, the chess grandmaster who who lost to Deep Blue, um, the 
IBM computer way back in, in 1997. And the idea is that the centaur, yeah, the classical, um, classical mythology, um, mythology, a centaur is a mixture of human intelligence and dexterity combined with horse strength and speed. Now, um, Kasparov um, obviously was um, beaten by the by the machine, but then following off that, it, it didn't stop there. He then carried on working with with artificial intelligence, and and he realised that, that that humans working with machines um, was, um, are actually better than just just machines themselves, and then. Um, in I think it's 2005 they decided to have uh, an online chess competition where it was open to everybody humans, computer programs, humans working with computer programs. They had some grandmasters, um, some working with computers. <coughs> the surprise to everybody was it was actually won by two amateur players who had been coached with by three um computer programs and they realized that actually you know weak humans combining with the machines plus good processes actually outperforms competent humans with machines and weak processes so obviously the idea then is if you are a strong human a competent um, person um, working with machines and you have good processes um yeah um you you have the uh, the capacity to, to do what um the, the best that you can do now this is not not a new idea i mean we've been working with computers for many decades um yeah we let them do automatic calculations um calculations can be find difficult drawing boards for example who i mean who of us here remembers drawing boards I mean, a few of us do at least. Um, now, we can all happily analyse and design a single beam, but if we've got a hundred, a thousand, yeah, you, you need to automate those. I mean, likewise, drawings. Um, I mean, a drawing on CAD or paper initially might be taking about the same sort of amount of time, but editing the CAD drawing, a lot quicker, far more efficient, and of course, BIM modelling, where we then got multiple plans and elevations and details which are all coordinated through the 3d model um yeah making use of the best of human with the best of machines um it's definitely the way forward um so is that going to go away um so what first of all what is what is artificial intelligence not um, there is a lot of hype around um, AI and this has been a characteristic of AI since its invention way back in the 1950s um, so let's get some misconceptions out of the way first uh, first of all artificial intelligence and machine learning they are not magic um, they are just a set of complex statistical algorithms regression analysis that's the thing, and they give us automatically predictions and insights into you know, complex data, complex problems. Um, so yeah, it's it's not always possible to understand why they're giving us the answers, but um, it depends. Um, I mean, it, it it's perhaps more as um, the famous author and engineer Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, once said that any sufficiently advanced technology is in indistinguishable for, for, from magic. So, it's not magic, and artificial intelligence is not intelligence. And now, as humans, we can generalize solutions from just a handful of examples. And here we have these these Bongard pa pattern recognition tests. Um, it's called, and we can quickly look at these and work out what the categories are. I mean, on the left, especially um, easy, we see you know large versus small, white versus black, 
Um, and AI programs have proved that they can categorize those on the left without too much trouble. Ones on the right, on the other hand, um, AI systems have really struggled to, 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 to work out what the categories are um, on, on the right hand side. Um, and there are um, more than more than this. Obviously, you can see just the numbers, they're, they're quite a few, but yes, um, they're, the number up into hundreds. I mean, for example, um, if we look at the number 98, we can see triangles and quadrilaterals on top of um, a hatching background. We can filter out the background and just look at what, what's interesting. AI systems really struggle to do that sort of thing. They tend to look at absolutely everything. Um, also, human intelligence is really good at interpolating um, that which is implied. Um, for example, on the left hand side, um, there is the white bordered um, Kanisa triangle. Um, I mean, can you see, see, see the white triangle? Again, AI cannot see the triangle because it's not actually there. But we can see it, we can infer the triangle from from from, from the surroundings. Um, also, we are less easily fooled um, than, than computers. I mean, look on the right side, side there, there are these two giraffes. They look identical to you and I, but for some reason, AI thinks they're quite different just because a few significant pixels ha have been changed. You can see the description underneath. Um, yeah, AI and machine learning does not recognize things in the same way that, 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 that we do. Um, and this can be an advantage, can be a disadvantage. Um, I mean, there was a famous example run by the US military. They wanted a computer system to automatically recognize camouflage tanks. Um, and it seemed to work all right um, at first, um, trained okay, but in, in practice, it was a complete disaster. And they realized what had happened was they, 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 had, they had pictures of tanks in camouflage and pictures of just landscape. The problem was the pictures and tanks and tanks in camouflage um they had a very short time to do it um they were on an army training range it was a cloudy day uh cloudy days and right all the pictures with tanks in had the cloudy sky whereas all the other landscape pictures were taken all the rest of the time uh um often with the blue skies that kind of thing and so what the program was learning was not to recognize camouflage tanks but recognizing what color the sky was um didn't help very much um ai can lack in robustness as well i mean is this a duck or a rabbit now we can recognize ambiguous data um ai will accept everything and it will give a result regardless it will say it is a duck or it is a rabbit it won't it won't hedge its bets. Now we can see that 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 this is ambiguous and therefore adjust accordingly. Uh, and we will need um, ultimately AI that can function well when when the inputs are um, not entirely certain. AI is also like us vulnerable to bias. Now our bias comes from upbringing, education, lack of education. Um, AI's bias comes from poor training data uh, and providing training data that is free of bias is a major problem for, for machine learning systems. And in this case, um, I'm sure you can recognize the former US president on the left hand side there. Um, problem with this system, it, it, was, it was trained in a database containing just white faces. Um, and there's also been, been cases where, you know, um, automatic hand dryers, put your hands on, on the hand dryers, trained um, by, on, by white engineers, don't recognize uh, the hands of other races, recruitment filters based on 
who has been recruited to the company previously. Um, means that if you want to increase diversity, it, the system is going to actually work, work at that against you if you're not careful. But when properly trained, um, the results can be very impressive. I mean, these 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 are some realistic images um, produced by machine learning from paintings. Um, but to produce these, they use an appropriate set of um, a database of examples, and will then be able to produce these these frankly quite realistic images. There's also AI does not possess common sense. Um, common sense is is knowledge which is learned from being in the world, but it is very difficult to quantify in advance. Uh, but it is needed to answer these questions. I mean, each each sentence here they differ by just one word, but that one word completely and ambiguously changes the subject of the sentence. I mean, we understand the concepts of full and empty, and therefore which container might be which after uh, after pouring the water. Um, whereas an AI system can recognise the words, how they connect grammatically, it doesn't understand the meaning. Um, and I mean, AI researchers have recognised this is a problem, and there has been a project to encapsulate all common common sense and that has been going on since 1984 and they are still nowhere near finished whereas as humans we just exist in the world and and we absorb common sense just by being being embodied um ai is also it's not aware or conscious um, you occasionally hear stories about you know, giving AI machines rights. I mean, this is extreme premature. Um, they have no self-awareness, no consciousness. I mean, we don't even understand how consciousness arises in our brains, and we have no way of knowing how to create it artificially. Self-aware artificial intelligence is still science fiction. And for example, you know, Deep Blue and AlphaGo both beat their, their respective world champions, but neither of them knew that they, or indeed their opponent, actually existed. Their knowledge. And I, AI is not going to be taking over the world, at least not in, not in the short term. Uh, stories of the created rebelling against the creator that they've been with us for thousands of years i mean garden of eden to the terminator or the matrix the golem you name it i mean humans have never liked feeling controlled uh, and they assume that any ai um likewise would feel the same way now this idea conflates intelligence with emotions now we animals have developed emotions to reward helpful behavior you know breeding feeding example or protection from danger fight or flight responses these sort of things these emotions would have to be explicitly added into an ai i mean we're more at risk of artificial stupidity than, than artificial intelligence such as self-driving cars that can't recognize a white truck against a bright sky automated stock programs um that that just will all buy and sell simultaneously, um, and and so on. So, if that's what AI is not, what is artificial intelligence? So, it is actually it's a wide range of programming methods to try and find answers to complex non-linear problems. I mean, it started way back in the 1950s, so pretty soon after the the dawn of the um, electronic computers in the 1940s and it was initially a quest to model human intelligence in computers um, it focused initially on symbolic manipulation to emulate thought processes words and numbers being symbols um, but symbolic ai really struggled to live up, up to its hype and it's, um, and it's not created um, but it has created some 
how they set up to their successful applications, but they're so successful now, we don't always recognize them as um, AI. For example, one of these is natural language processing, which is now found in many homes and pockets. So, um, machine learning, um, it can pass speech sounds into words, then natural language processing, can group the words into sentences, work out which parts are nouns, verbs, adjectives from grammatical rules, then determine what the instructional question is. And it will then try to find the answer from the internet or play the music of choice or do something completely random. Now, personally speaking, um, one of my cats is called Sirius or Siri for short, and he really confuses my, my phone. Um, one thing to say from this as well, that um, grammar checkers in Word and other word processing programs, these are AI applications or an offshoot from, from artificial intelligence research. So you are using AI programs already. Um, also, search routines, these are also um, artificial intelligence. I mean, it's not possible to directly solve the question, what is the shortest route between two points, apart from a straight line, we're talking real world problems here. Um, instead, AI research produces algorithms such as a star and so on to intelligently search for the shortest route through a mixture of estimates, calculation, data storage, and so on. So your sat nav um, is, again, is an, is an AI application. Also, um, sorting through unsorted, searching through unsorted databases is also an AI application. And the most famous of which has, has become a verb to Google. Um, Google search rankings were initially based on keywords and web page connection to predict what the best order was to present the results. Um, and they've subsequently added on machine learning to record what links people actually click on and so on. This is the reason why um, Google is now possibly the world's largest AI research um, company. Every, almost everything that Google does is, is, is artificial intelligence. Um, AI is also automated decision making. Um, so one of the aims is, one of the aims can be to encapsulate knowledge and enable the decision making. And this can be in the forms of expert systems or state search. Now an expert system um, that looks to encode experts knowledge and also the way they solve our problems. Now these have proved difficult um, as I mean, most people can struggle to articulate how they solve problems. I mean, maybe how they solve a particular problem, but how they solve general problems or problems in general, these are difficult things to generalize. Um, and then there are state searches. Now, a state search will build a tree of possible decisions and then navigates their way through to find the best answer or at least the most promising route to the answer. And these have proved successful, um, especially in games, um, which are formal, have rules, and are bounded. Um, and it was a state search um, system that that formed the basis of, of Deep Blue, which which built um, which built Kasparov. Um, now, you might think that um, the the computer can search all the possible moves in chess and work out all possible ways of winning, but this even now this this is not proved possible. I mean, a game of chess in the first four turns has about 16 billion possible moves um, and over a typical game um, there is approximately 10 to the power 120 possible moves it is just not possible to check them all um, so it's that searching and prediction of what the best options are Um, similarly to state search, um, we can build these trees 
from existing data. Um, and we can use this to find correlations between events and incidents. The idea is we can then propose a new condition and the state tree let's say what the underlying causes probably are. Now the problem with um, a, um, a, a state tree or decision tree is that one tree only works in one particular case and we need to generalize predictions for the future based on what's happened in the past and to do this we create large numbers of pruned trees um, and a large number of trees is called a forest um, and so we have random forests which then presented with new data um, each tree then votes on what it thinks is the likely answer and yeah the winner is then presented now, random forests have proved very successful in applications such as medical diagnosis and so on. Um, and then there's neural net networks. Now, neural networks in theory have been around since the 1960s. They were initially very unsuccessful. We've now got much faster processors, powerful training algorithms, huge amounts of data supplied by the internet. Um, and these have now become the dominant machine learning uh, methods. Now they're inspired by, by the brains, um, how they connect together, how brains work to collate data and basically it's pattern recognition. Now neural networks were used by AlphaGo to be the Go world champion. Now game of Go, so chess has about 10 to the power 120 possible moves Go has 10 to the power 360 possible moves. And it's also extremely difficult to measure the quality of any particular move while you're playing. Now AlphaGo beat, beat the world champion using deep learning to predict the best moves. And it was trained um, on existing um, grandmaster level games, but also playing against itself. And it's often forgotten that optimization is a form of artificial intelligence. That, um, that search for the choosing the best answers from a myriad of options and so on. Now, optimization is actually a huge range of methods, many of which are inspired by, by nature, the evolution of life, how life works together, how bones react when they're exercised and so on. Um, Optimization itself is, is, a, is a huge topic within the topic of, of AI machine learning. So let's delve into a few in a little more detail. First of all, um, yeah, I mentioned random forests earlier. How do random forests actually work? So yeah, a forest is made up of trees, and a random forest is made up of random decision trees. Now these generated from data um, and relational data in the, in the decision tree, we might start from the root, choose one of an option, and from here we go to another option, and so on, until we, we reach terminal node, and that gives us the answer of what is likely to happen, the outcome. Um, so here's an example toy data set, toy being small, not particularly realistic, but illustrative. And in this case, there are two options regarding foundation type, trench fill or strip, two types of soil, clay or silt, and two contractors involved in the project. And the result was either a cracked wall above or one in good condition. Now, in this instance, we could look at the whole data simultaneously, but obviously real data sets, vast and, and, and two different anyway. But so we'll keep this simple and from this data, we can create a, a decision tree. In this instance, um, I chose foundations first, followed by the soil, followed by the contractor. These can be in any order and would produce a different tree. Um, so um, three factorial in this case, six trees. And at the end, um, we might see whether um, a, wall, <coughs> a wall was definitely cracked the wall is definitely not cracked or the data is ambiguous sometimes it cracks sometimes it, it doesn't 
And obviously the real data tree is much, much bit bigger than this simple example. Um, now, a complete representation of the data that we've already collected can only tell us what did happen in a particular case and only can tell us what will happen next time if the situation exactly matches. Um, but it struggles to tell us what is significant in here. Um, to understand what is significant and what's likely to happen with different situations, we need multiple pruned trees. So we make pruned copies of the full tree um, on a random basis, um, maybe taking one or two or three of, of the various um, variables and varying the order and so on. And um, so the, 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 these prune trees, they simplify, they encapsulate some of the information, they might obscure some of the information and so on. And again, each individual tree is not particularly useful, but what we then do in the new situation, we present the data or the input to all the trees. They then all give their answers back and um, we then see which is maybe, which is maybe the average um, result comes back or what is the option with the most votes and so on. Um, and so th these have proved very, very successful. And unlike some forms of AI or machine learning, random, um, random forests are something we can actually go and interrogate to find out why it is that they, that they, that they gave, us, gave us that answer. On the other hand, um, you know, deep learning, on the other hand, this is something which is more opaque. So um, neural networks, deep learning, um, these are machine learning systems which are inspired by how our brains work. So our brains, as you know, that there are a collection of special nerves called, called neurons. Each of these neurons receives an input from a host of other neurons via its own dendrites. This collection you see on the left hand side there. Um, if it gets enough signals, it then fires an electrochemical signal down its axon to connect to other neurons and so on. And, and we combine billions of these together in our brains. And somehow, we're not sure how, but this gives rise to thought, intelligence and consciousness whatever consciousness, consciousness is. Um, I mean, the question of you know, how do you create a conscious AI? We can't tell if an AI is conscious. We can't even prove that the person next to us is conscious. Um, and indeed, there's lots of that philosophy um, suggesting that consciousness and actual thought rather than programming is even possible in a computer. No, even that is, is, is debated. Um, it's an interesting area. So, artificial um, neurons. These work by taking a numerical input, um, x1 to n, and we always give this as a value between 0 and 1. And each of these is then multiplied by a, weight, a different weighting value, um, uh, which can be negative. Now, um, these are then summed together, and these are then squashed um, using this uh, sigmoid for function to take that answer and then output a number again between 0 and 1. Generally 0 and 1, but there's that fuzzy boundary in the middle where eh, things are not quite sure. Now, a single artificial neuron can't tell us very much. Um, but we've got multiple nodes, they, from a variety of inputs, they might be able to give us um, the answer we're looking for. You know, um, and in this case, we've got three outputs, maybe the maybe only one of them will, 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 will flag up as one, or maybe the highest value will say this is the most likely answer, and so on. Now, the question I'm sure you're asking is, is how do we decide what the weights are, these W values are on, on each input? And to do this, we use a set of training data where we know what, what, what the answers are. Um, we feed those in 
and we then get an answer out and we then calculate the error which is the difference between what we expected and what we actually got and no i'm not going to explain the formulas um this is not this isn't this is it's a talk not not a lecture so um rest at ease and also there, there's no test at the end um now uh, once we've got the error we work out um a, a, a training value so how much we're going to adjust the weight and the values beyond below and then we actually adjust the weights in the network and we then input the next training set of data and and, and we keep we keep cycling through until the neural network is giving the answers that that consistently that we want now except that a single layer of nodes is nowhere near sophisticated enough um, to give us the answer we want from complex data. So we actually need um, a layer of hidden nodes in between the input and output nodes. Um, now the training formulas are more complex for these hidden hi, hi, hidden nodes. Hidden being they're neither the input nor the outputs. Um, and so we have to calculate the error on the output and also the, the new error on the hidden layer and so on. Um, and once these algorithms were developed, neural networks began to, to to take off. Except we then found that these weren't sophisticated enough, and so with the advent of more powerful training algorithms, faster computers, and so on, I mean, it can still take weeks to train a neural net network, and a lot more training data sets, thank you, Internet. Um, the successful applications of neural networks now use multiple levels of hidden, hidden nodes, which makes them deep. Um, thus, we have the expression deep learning. Um, this is now the most common machine learning algorithm. In fact, generally, if people talk about machine learning, they usually refer to usually referring to deep learning systems. Now, in this image here, um, I've just got two layers of hidden nodes, but a real system can have maybe half a dozen um, hidden layers and likewise the number of inputs and outputs can vary into the hundreds or even thousands. Um, now another way of working with existing data is to use is make predictions um, using Bayesian inference. Now Thomas Bayes, um, uh, vicar, philosopher, mathematician, um, is formula looks quite simple um and it says that we can make predictions or forecasts on what will probably happen using a combination of some existing data plus our own intu intuition or expertise um, um if the complete data is not available now um unlike political pundits bayesian inference gives a percentage chance of knowing of, of some event happening posterior um, given what, what we know and if we were to use our toy data set uh, from earlier we might note that hey, a wall's cracked and we might then predict what soil is below or maybe what the foundation was actually um, or who the contractor was um, all, all without doing um, further digging. Now um, basis formula can also be represented in a slightly different way um, based on you know, how likely is that double A, whatever A is, was caused by B um, by looking at how often A and B occur together and divide that by the probability of B occurring in, in total. Now, Bayesian inference it has proved very successful in a wide range of fields, medicine, weather forecasting, um, earthquake forecasting, um, sports gambling, um, you name it. Um, there are some um, very useful ap applications for, for us here. And again, Bayesian inference is it, 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 quite transparent with the data. Also, if you are using your own experience and it gives you an answer, it can help you improve um, what um, and build on what you already know. The more the more knowledge you can put into it over over pure guesswork, the better the answers will be. 
Um, and speaking of medicine, biological evolution in particular, uh, we can use a particular type of machine learning that can optimize our structures by learning what does work and what does not work. And these are genetic algorithms. Now, genetic algorithms are similar to real, real, uh, real breeding. So a genetic algorithm takes two members of a population of possible answers to a structural design. A yeah, structural scheme, for example, a combination of beam sizes and a vibrating moment frame, and you know, I'm using steel or concrete, timber, masonry, you know. Um, you can have all, all these variables, all these schemes, and we can test them. And the ones which give good answers, we crossbreed to, to create a new range of um, um, designs. Now. One of the trickier aspects of genetic algorithms is representing the data, and we normally need to represent this in a binary form, um, the genetic code, the DNA, um, and this, so everything has to be represented in the strings of ones and zeros. And the second is judging the fitness um, of the proposed solution. Um, you know, the, 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 we want to judge the fitness, the suitability of the system or solution so that the most promising are given a better chance of being incorporated or contribute towards the, the next generation. Um, but we also want genetic diversity um, if we get to get the best answers, otherwise the, op the algorithms can converge on a sub-optimal answer. So how does this work? So here's, here's an example. A generation of points, the red dots, uh, in a search space, the range of possible design options and in this case, the fitness is how close they are to to, 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 to to the green diamond. Okay, in a real project, we would not know where the optimum is, but hey, if we knew where the optimum was, but there's no point in running the genetic algorithm. This is an example. So, um, in this case, we describe the location of every point in the range of design variables um, using its coordinates. Um, using and the coordinate presented in a binary form. Um, in this case, it is a pure coordinate, but also these numbers might represent a particular beam size from a list, or a concrete grade, or whether a brace is on or off, and so on. And we've just got two variables here, but these can be very many, many variables creating quite long strings. Um, now we then judge each member of the generation um, given their relative fitness. In structural terms, it might be how much carbon um, is used, how much material is used, how, how expensive is it going to be, uh, and so on. How close they are to an optimum answer. Um, in this case, we just say how close they are to their center point. And we then give, we then give a percentage chance based on that which we then use to randomly choose two of the the um, the items from the from generation. We will then randomly let me see the two numbers here. We then randomly assign a, a a crossover point. In this instance, I chose straight down the middle, a little bit easier to read, and we then we then produce two new genomes um, from the original genomes. And we then process these genomes to create the phenome, um, which in this case is just just, just, just the coordinates. Um, and we keep doing that for um, randomly choosing um, the, the members of the last generation until we 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 create a complete new generation. End result. Um, yeah, I mean in this case um, the. Genuinely, the the the, the um, from from a random basis, the next generation I produced in this case was, was the green triangles, and three of the points are actually closer to, to the origin, um, which was um, a comforting surprise. Um, but you also note there's this triangle out here on the periphery. Um, now, most of them improved. This one hasn't. 
um, if they think, oh, that's a problem. But no, actually, geez, these runts litter, they can be very useful. Um, these are the ones which keep the exploration of the space, exploring the options going, because one of these might strike lucky and, and, and find a better solution than the one we're honing in down for down here. There is always a risk for you, you, you have a premature optimization to a, a sub-optimal solution or a local maxima. It's a bit like, you know, um, you're trying to find the highest mountain in the UK um, and you might just end up on, on Dartmoor. Dartmoor's a nice place. It's quite high, not as high as Ben Nevis or, or, or Snowden and so on. Um, all these things have to be taken into account. And when we're doing an optimization, we don't really know where where the peaks are, which hence the reason why, why, why we are doing the search. Now, genetic algorithms can have problems as well. If, the, if you've got a large number of variables, it can take a very long time to, to run these. And so if you are going to do this sort of optimization, it's worthwhile choosing um, which variables you do use, which ones you choose to exclude. Um, another optimization routine um, is inspired by nature again. In this case, it's the swarming of bees, flocking of birds, and so on, where they, and they're then coordinated to find food. So here, with the particle swarm optimization, we are searching through the design space, you know, the range of design options, using a number of moving particles. Um, these are just points in the design space which are used to record our location and also the directory through the design space. And at each increment, they, they calculate the quality of the point they are at the moment. And, and, they, and, and to then, to work out where they're going next, they'll look at their own velocity, the direction to their own best result, direction to the swarm's best result overall, and this then produces a new direction to move through through the design space. Um, and yeah, um, they move through space through velocities, and yeah, that they that what they will do then is they will tend to converge on the optimal location. Now, um, in my exper experiments, what actually has happened is that maybe one or two of the particles will hone in on the on the on the on the optimum it will exploit the optimum as we call it the others will continue to explore in the vicinity and again one of these might find a better solution and then the algorithm will then shoot off and start exploring around there as well like genetic algorithms they're not guaranteed to find the optimum again it um, can find a suboptimum but um, again, same problems. It should find a good answer, but it's not exactly the best answer. Now, particle swarms are less known than genetic algorithms, but there's some suggestions that they can find the optimal solution faster than genetic algorithms. But possibly also they might be better at slightly different problems. Um, genetic algorithms with that binary string, these are very good for discrete problems, you know, beam sizes, there are discrete numbers of universal beams. Whereas particle swarms, they can be better at more continuous the data, you know, the exact size of a concrete beam, for example, or something like that. Um, no one method is the best. Um, and that can be part of the frustration and joy of, of working with these systems. So um, some problems to be careful of, um, what was the warning? Um, first of all, you know, if you are using existing data, machine learning often is, there are risks. So there's the data points. You might underfit the data. Now, underfitting does not capture essential information hidden in the data. It's too general. Overfitting, on the other hand, enables you to exactly match existing data, but it is then useless for generalizing. Um, the ideal is, is there in the center where you found the essence of the data, um, essence of what's happening, but not so much that you are not able to make use of it um, in the future. I mean, how do you know when you've hit the sweet spot? 
the Goldilocks zone, as it's called. Um, now, usually with doing machine learning, you you do it on just a subset of data, maybe half or two thirds of the data. You can then use the rest of your data to test your results. And if the test data matches the training data, then hey, well and good, um, you, you got it right. If not, you go back and 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 try again. Also, uh, machine learning may discover some correlations between data, but that does not mean that one thing causes another. Um, they might just be based on the same underlying cause. For example, there is a correlation between ice cream sales and shark attacks. Um, but yeah, the more ice cream that's licked, the more swimmers that are bitten. But it's not the ice cream sales which cause the shark attacks, and it's not the shark attacks which cause the ice cream sales. Um, instead, they are both caused by the same thing, hot weather, um, and the desire to cool down either by eating or, or, or swimming in something cold. So how might we use artificial intelligence for our designs and so on? Now, um, I think AI is going to be a key for us to supply and achieve net, net zero in construction. Um, I mean, we cannot achieve net zero just by planting more trees, um, but by causing less damage to the environment in the first place. Now, machine learning can use existing data, the ideal existing projects, ideal projects to maybe recommend a design approach that, that improve efficiency. Um, it can allow us to explore design options. We might not have time or patience to do manually. Um, might use you know, where efficient use of materials won't solve all the problems. You know, it, it's going to be a major contributor to minimizing the amount of carbon that our designers need to offset. Likewise, best way to achieve zero carbon is to not build in the first place. And we can use machine learning to monitor existing structures, especially the vibrations and frequencies and so on, and back calculate from the vibrations what the stiffness of the structure is and therefore what the condition of that structure is, compare it to as-built drawings and so on. Um, yeah, improving designs. I mean, this is an example from Arab and China. Um, first, they use optimization to improve the bracing layout um, give the best overall form. And these sort of approaches would require hundreds or thousands of analysis and design iterations to get to the final results. Um, but also, of course, to remember that this is not the end of the design, it's the start of the design. Um, once we've created the design, the scheme, um, again, we go through all the usual detailed design checks to ensure it's economic robust, safe, buildable, and meets all the client requirements. Um, then there's the administration. Um, and certainly this is one of the areas I'm most looking forward to, an automated administration assistant. I mean, there are some AI bots already which can arrange meetings with clients based on emails. Others can field questions on websites until it gets to a question it can't answer, then they'll pass it to a human um, to, to answer that, um, I mean, I'm already using Outlook to remember all my appointments and phone numbers for me, but I always wanted to help me prioritise. Which emails do I need to respond to first? Um, maybe give suggestions um, and flag up, mm, yeah, that email from, from your director. You really should answer that one. That sort of thing. Um, I mean, and engineering assistants are already on site, starting to be used. For example, you can already request site surveys by drones or spot the dog here. Um, they can make take point clouds. AI can then convert the point clouds into 3D models to predict um, to check progress and accuracy. Um, you can have concrete batching plants which monitor the materials going into the mix and the concrete going out to so point adjust and give instant quality control. Um, I mean I see AI becoming like a, a smart but inexperienced graduate engineer, fresh from college with the latest ideas, uh, lacking in common sense and practical experience, but we trust them to come up with good ideas and suggestions. 
do calculations and designs, but there's only going to be issues after careful checks to see what's been missed, what's been misunderstood, and so on. And also, I would definitely not send a robot to a, a, a client meeting. So, conclusion, how should we use engineers? There is, yeah, how should we use AI? Um, there is a lot of hype around AI. It's not without its problems, but there are also quite a lot of successes and useful applications available to us. And the most important thing is, you know, we make use of these tools where they help us, but with our eyes open. I mean, Deep Blue did not stop people playing chess. On the contrary, the top players train against AI and work with them, and they use AI to produce the best, the, the best players. And we engineers should take a similar approach. Uh, work with the computers, as we do at the moment, use, use our own strengths of creativity, common sense, understanding, interpretation, with AI's ability to explore options, automate tasks, and even those which are too complex for classically programmed computers to resolve. Uh, the engineer of the future is, I believe, a, a centaur. Um, now, as I mentioned, um, I cover all these topics and more in, in in computational engineering. And I must say, I'm very grateful that it's been very well received uh, and attracted some amazing reviews from, from around the world. If you want to be a centaur, I think you may find it of interest. Um, at that point, yeah. Um, are there any questions? Thanks, Peter. Um... Does anybody have any questions? Oh. Okay, I can kick, kick off if you like. Um, I see someone got their hand up. Oh, come, come, come. Oh, sorry. Have I have I missed someone got their hand up? No. More. More Tyler. Is that his name? Oh. I good evening. Hi. Basically, um, AI is something that fascinates me so much. But it's something that I am very much curious about, and I hope you can help me to like to. I feel, or I really do not know how it could be yeah, probably fully deployed, because basically I was thinking that uh, AI can actually help come up with some, for example, you have a structure to design, for example, you have a maybe a two-story or three-story building to design, and you want, you want your, uh, a machine model that can help you provide you like with several skin, several skin options, for instance of structural elements and all that could lead to probably a very good optimized structure. And I'm thinking now that could be adopted in practice. Like, I really don't know how it could be, one could go about it. Yeah, um, I think... Did you get my question? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is... I mean, the, 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 this is sort of cutting edge. That there are, there are no products out there apart from optimization which i'm aware of was actually directly using ai apart from optimization routines for engineering design these are things that that, that researchers are, are 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 working on so um maybe I, I think that's maybe something which we might be seeing in over the next few years or maybe even decades um so there are some things you can do now some things will come eventually. Um, I mean, one of the quite often things something like machine learning, they work best uh, when you're sort of data rich, machine theory poor. Most a lot of engineering problems like beam theory, beam design, that sort of thing, with theory rich, data poor. So it's not going to be it's not going to be applied everywhere, but yeah, there may well be areas where machine learning and artificial intelligence are useful to us in future on top of the the the, the ai systems that, that, that we're already using 
Okay. Ah. I, I can understand that it may be something for the future, more of the future than the present. But yeah, I would really want to see how it unfolds. Because I think we can help us by a lot in our regard. Yeah, we're, we're sort of looking at now, looking at the looking at the present into into the future here. Yeah, this is this is not this is um uh, a mixture of what's currently available and what what hopefully will, will be available to us. Thank you, Karim. Karim, you had a, you had a question. Well, I was just going to um, put one in there um, <laughs> just for uh, everyone. Um, just to get the ball rolling, but yeah, I can I can still ask a couple. Uh, one of them was <clears throat> in your um, model for um, uh, the neural net. Mm -hmm. I noticed that in the hidden layer, the uh, the nodes are not talking to each other; they're only they're sort of independent. Is that deliberate? Uh, yeah. Well, where's the where's, where's the diagram again? Uh, let me bring it. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah. So 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 the they. On any given row or column, in this case, um, they don't directly talk, talk to each other. They, well, they they sort of interact with each other by feeding the data forwards into the next row. Um, so, um, yeah, the information is sort of collated forwards into the next row and then into the next row again, into the next row again. So by the time you get to the output, it has each output has received input from all the all the nodes previously my, my point my point is mm. that if you take a let's say the first uh, column of hidden layers yeah. right hidden nodes right mm -hmm. they're not talking to each other that's interesting no not directly um yeah yeah that, that they're they're indirectly through through the through the adjacent layers i mean and also this is one of the differences between a, a neural network and an actual brain, for example. I mean, brain the brain still seems to work in this layered form. Um, um, when they're, they're gradually sort of collating data as as they, as they as they as they go through the various layers, um, but in the real brain, for example, there are also some of these the, the, these nodes actually connect back to earlier layers. I mean, you may have noticed so. Um, when you look at something, you know the light goes into your eye. There is the the, the retina cells. Each of these cells will be an input node. These these follow through into the brain, and each bit of the brain then recognizes things, edges, hands, faces, people, that sort of thing. But also, um, the brain also is very good at filtering out that which it's not interested in. Um, it brains like novelty. Um, for example, is you're walking through the jungle and there's leaves rustling all around you. You filter them out, but there's a tiger there. The tiger goes jump out on you. Tiger's different. The brain goes, oh, there's a tiger. Um, ignores the leaves, focuses on the tiger, and then in response to that. So, so the brain is very good at sort of filtering out these common things by feeding back neural networks generally don't do that there are some which do do that especially if they're time dependent um mm -hmm. music neural networks would tend to feed back through, through the system but i wonder if there's um there must be an evolutionary pressure um reason why we forget things as well mm. i guess memories are not always a good thing no um i mean um it our memories are also comprised of the, these neural networks and, and the neurons mm -hmm. learn and strengthen and Hey, I mean, we've got billions and billions of them, but I mean, do we want to remember everything? Exactly. Uh, I, I shouldn't hog this no. because we've got uh, several in the chat oh, now. Good, good. So uh, we've got something from Krishna. I can't see the full name there. That's uh, from Krishna. He asks, uh, in coming years, what are um, the areas of instructional engineering AIs will dominate? Like. Uh, structural health monitoring, etc. So he's mm. asking for your views of, about that. Yeah. So I think I think structural health monitoring is one which is definitely going to become very important, and likewise the optimization um, of, of of complex structures is is also going to become a, become important. Um, 
also you know um, AI on site we're, we're already seeing um, automated site pro pro progress surveys um, and, and and these will become far more common and they're specialists at the moment I see that those are going to be very very, very common and the, likewise okay. there may also be things which we just haven't thought of I mean if you go back sure. 15 years who could predict the influence of mobile phones on what on my modern life it's, it's part, part of the excitement okay the next one uh i think that's from neil it says how does the engineer explain the details found by an ai assistant um how do they explain it um i wouldn't say you explain it you would judge it um yeah the ai is there to Point things out and 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 and, and make suggestions. Um, some things like neural networks, they are very difficult to interpret why they gave the answers. Things like random forests, these are much easier to to to, to interpret. Um, I mean, heck, um, even sometimes interpreting why a finite M analysis program has given you a different result can be a challenge um i mean that's usually the case of uh, you've either put the model in wrong or your understanding was wrong but yeah this is this is this is what this is, this is what engineering knowledge is all about um sure. these are not going to supplant expert engineers um this okay. is just going to fine-tune some of our some of our jobs so you just mentioned right Random forests. So there's a uh, a question from Aditya, uh, and he says, uh, "Do random forests fit for, uh, uh, fit the uh, conceptual design stage?" Um, potentially. I mean, the hard part there is um, where is it going to um, to create a random forest which helps you with the scheme the stage? Um, you would need to create the relationships um, in the system which could then help you potentially um, but yeah um, maybe it will maybe it won't I mean the, 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 this is an area maybe to, to uh, think about okay uh, one from Avin uh, asks um, um, is the optimization algorithm and machine learning algorithms are they the same uh, optimization and i don't think they are but I'm no sure there's there, there are many many different algorithms i mean the optimizations i'll talk about there they are a form of machine learning where the system is searching through the design options that you provide um to then say these are the best ones based on the criteria again that that that, that you provide but there are yeah that there are many many different um algorithm options and indeed um i cover a lot more in the book and again i mean there's there's about two dozen different algorithm options that i talk about for just optimization itself um, yeah that mm -hmm. it, it's it's, okay. it's a broad subject thanks um i think that's it in terms of the um questions in the chat mm -hmm. um does anybody have uh, does anybody want to ask anything or you know just our uh, without putting the hand up just just far away if you want hi peter can you hear me hi, hello. Yeah. Uh, veronica hello yeah awesome um so i think my interest is how the knowledge is being passed on between generations as you probably know you've been in this industry for quite a while um do you think ai will play um some sort of a helping hand in capacity building or knowledge transfer between the different generations? Mm, good question. Um, I mean, certainly computation, um, computer storage is already has the capability of, of doing that. So, yeah, I can see. It. I mean, the so, yeah, the I mean, the way that AI works, it tends to um you know sort of learn from what um yeah i think it has the potential yeah it has the potential to have the potential for sort of transferring and retaining 
methodologies and that sort of thing. But I mean, in abstract form, no, mm. no, 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 maybe not, not in quite, not in the same way that that, that we work. But um, but yeah, but, but that's mm. the advantage of you know, neural diversity, I suppose. Different, different. Okay, methods. we've got a hand up from Sarah. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Uh, oh, hi, thanks. Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Sarah. <laughs> That's a very interesting talk. Thank you, Peter. Um, my, I'm uh, now a retired engineer, um, and you mentioned experienced engineers looking at what the output mm -hmm. and uh, deciding where perhaps there are errors or, or whether it sort of feels right. Yep. Looking for the future, the young engineers of today will have used AI all the way through their career. So how do they um, get that knowledge mm. without doing what I did going through my career and sort of, if you like, learning by my mistakes and getting a feel for it when the computer is doing so much? Yeah, good question. I mean, I mean, similarly, the we've had finite element analysis um, since oh, I think the 1960s, and yeah, and um, it's it's a tool to be used in conjunction, um, and yeah, it, it's it, it's it's an assistance. I mean, I've used FE all my career, but um, I've also learned how to do quick hand counts, simple models, simple checks, <coughs> honed my own experience um, on, on design and methodologies and recognising the right answers. Yeah, they're... It's definitely, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a definitely a generational thing. And and mm. um, on that point, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in the computational design and... and no, digital workflows and computational design panel, the iStrat T, uh, one of the questions that comes up is, you know, should we allow computers in the childership exam? And, yeah. um, I mean, when I did my childership way back in the 90s, in that stage, I was going, oh, where are the computers? I, I, mm. I do things with computers. Um, and then as I did the childship preparation, I realized that, nope, it, it, that it, the chart of exam, computer free, apart from calculators, is totally the right, right, right approach. Because to become a chartered engineer, you need to know the answers. You need to know how to find the answers quickly and then use other tools and so on to help you fine tune them and everything. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm the panel will be totally in agreement that 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 that, that is remaining with, I mean, I think in theory you possibly could program a machine, a program to pass the exam. Eventually, it would be very difficult. But in theory, it could be done. But I, even then, I wouldn't send them. I wouldn't let them loose on a, a real design project. Yeah, it, it's it, it's the working on projects. It's it it's been mentored by, by by more senior engineers. It's it's real life experiences. It's getting through the chartership exam to make sure you've got that knowledge I, I i don't see those things changing um yeah and you know um computers give us answers slide rules give people answers prior to that people were doing um testing um, i mean maths itself was apparently quite controversial in between brunel and telford um mm. telford hated maths um, and thought proper engineers shouldn't use maths. It was a nasty foreign French invention, which, and <laughs> Brunel was French, let's face it, or, or French parents. No, French father, English mother. Anyway, um, trained in France with, 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 with these foreign methods, and it was controversial. Um, how can people learn by just by doing sums? It's just, it's an ongoing problem, and mm. graduate engineers never know as much as more experienced people. Uh, and that will be <laughs> an internal, um, eternal thing, I think. Thank you. Thanks. Um, any final questions for anyone? Okay, well, 
I think it just remains for me to thank Peter for uh, his presentation today. I think um, if you were, uh, he used a classical reference for um, what the uh, future of an engineer would be, which is a centaur. Um, but uh, I guess uh, a more modern one would be um, a Borg or something mm. like that, wouldn't it? <laughs> with the machine bits stuck to, yeah. to him or her. Um, mind you, they don't have much of a personality. Not much. Um, no. no. Um, so I think that uh, as time goes on, we'll be using the these you know machines as tools you know and as long as they remain tools i think uh, they'll be very useful yeah. um like somebody said about uh, fire and water they they make good servants but poor masters mm. and i think it's the same with computers very much so very much so yeah so thank you very much peter and um Thank you for everyone else for attending today. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. And normally I would say at this point, um, have a safe journey home. Mm. But uh, I guess most of us are more or less uh, at home anyway. But so thank you for attending anyway and uh, sparing your time. And uh, we will, uh, our next meeting is in uh, January. Um, so we've got uh, December clear and then January we start off the new year with our tradition what is now becoming a tradition of the Pecha Kucha meetings um, that will be a, it's in uh, Exeter this year I can't remember whether it's in Exeter or Plymouth it is in Exeter it is in Exeter right so uh, uh, look out for that uh, at the beginning of January and uh, we uh, till then uh, have a very pleasant evening and a very nice Christmas holiday. Better culture, if I may say, will be a hybrid in person or yeah. online. Both, in fact, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I think we can then um, con uh, close the meeting. We have a, a thank you from Peter Martin Stroud, just saying it's a very that was a very interesting talk. So thanks, Peter, again. Uh, so we can, I think we should end the meeting there and uh, good night, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye okay. then.